I want to introduce you to our next speaker. Uh, his name is Bryce Templeton, and um, anytime we say the word PEMS at the agency, we think Bryce. Uh, not only is he just a good guy, I mean, he knows a lot about PEMS. I mean, Bryce has been at the agency for 26 years, so you can imagine the wealth of knowledge that he has. Help me in welcoming Bryce Templeton. Thank you, Diane and, and Carol and all those who put this together. It's a pleasure to be back again at this event this year. I know this is a brand new group, and uh, it's great that they've got a program where they can rotate different administrators in and out of this symposium and this leadership academy. So this morning we're going to talk about career technical education as it relates to PEAMS reporting. And the first thing that I want to do my contact information is at the beginning and it's at the end of this presentation and I think everybody's got a, a copy of, of that in front of them. I want to tell you that last time I did this we had one PEAM system. Right now during 1516 we have two. And everybody in this room that represents a school district is going to submit their data in only one of these two systems this year. So one of them is the legacy PEAM system, the thing that's been around since the rollout in 1990, 91, and it's gone through several iterations. Today you would know it as Edit Plus. And Edit Plus is wore out. It can't take any more. In fact, my boss just texted me on the way over here this morning and said, it's down again. So uh, they're working on that. So um, we just got to last one more school year. The second system is the Texas Student Data System. And I saw one or two hands go up here. So the first thing I want to do this morning is um, help you identify which one you're in this year. So earlier I walked around, and on each table in the very center is a thick packet and it lists every school district and charter school in the state by region and then alphabetically by name. So if somebody would take the, the leadership at each of the table and get started here, we, I want you to look at this report and very, see if we can very quickly in just a few minutes figure out which system your school has got to submit through for the 15-16 school year. Okay. So let's have a, a, a volunteer. Somebody raise their hand and give me their region and their district number. Region 10. Region 10. DeSoto. Okay. All right. So I'm going to flip through this report till I find the region 10 rows. And then I'm looking for D for DeSoto. DeSoto ISD. Okay. DeSoto ISD. was an early adopter in 1415, meaning you helped TEA test the system, but y'all haven't selected one or the other yet. So that means by default, you're still going to be in the legacy PM system for 1516, unless your superintendent wants to come on over and then they can make that. So when you look at this, the columns here, LPR was limited production release schools. And those helped us test back in 1314. During 1415, the EA, early adopter schools, helped us test the system. And then 1516, if there's an X there by your district name, a stage one, that means that your superintendent has signed your school up to do PEAMS submission in 1516 through the TSDS system. And no, you can't get out of it. Yes, sir. Stage one, okay, we're, we can't take all 1,250 some odd schools in the first year. So we're taking approximately 600 districts in 1516, and those are stage one. Okay. Stage two will be the rest of you that will come on in 1617, and there'll be no choice because Edit Plus won't be around anymore. They're not going to update it for, for 1617. <laughs> If you're an X in stage one, your, your superintendent has opted to submit PEMS for 1516 through TSDS. If you're stage two, your superintendent has opted to do it in 1617. 
If there's an X in neither one, your superintendent hasn't responded to the inquiry from TEA to select one, right? Which means that you will by default have to do it in 15, 16, edit plus. Unless your superintendent contacts the, the, the program managers at TEA and asks to be in stage one. So, yes ma'am? Edit Plus is the old, the, si the legacy system, right. Okay? The reason I want to make this distinction this morning is that I'm going to reference some reports to you later on. And depending upon which system you're submitting your data through, you're going to have to look for reports that look a little bit different and work a little bit different. The content is the same, but the numbers are different and the functionality is different. The big difference between the two systems when you boil it all down is that when you get to the reports where you're looking at your data and you're trying to validate it, the old legacy Edit Plus system are PDF reports. You can print them off, you can save them, you can attach them to an email, you can fold them up and make paper airplanes out of them, but that's all you can do. But in TSDS, the reports have parameters. You can download the data to Excel and other kind of portable formats and then do something with it. So it's going to be much more technology user friendly for people that want to pull the data out and do something with it. You don't want to ask your PMS coordinator to run a custom report out of your student information system. You go to this TSTS PMS app, you pull the report down, you download it to Excel or whatever you want, and you do whatever you want to do with it. Email it. Break it up. Send it to the principal. So it's going to be much greater functionality. But your PEMS coordinators will have a greater challenge on the front end because it takes a little more effort to get the data into the system. But the beauty of the TSDS system is that you can start loading your data for your school year from the first day of school. You can start populating the data warehouse. You're, you have your own data warehouse out there in this system and it will populate what we call dashboards for your teachers. And every morning it, that after your school has loaded data to the system, you'll come in and these dashboards will be refreshed with anything that's been updated and you will have instantaneous, up-to-date information about your students based upon the latest information in your student information system. So it's going to be a tremendous tool, a tremendous advance forward. But, and I'm, just look at this, uh, document and figure out which one you're in so that you know when you go back how to have the right conversation with your PEAMS coordinator. I have a quick question just because I know we're going to get into the region. So 16, 17, we've all moved to TSTS. Are we going to go back to the Great question about all the historical data. The historical data will remain available in Edit Plus for three years at which time they will turn the lights off, pull it down off the server, and put it to rest. Let it go into retirement. It's ready. Okay? Okay. Everybody good on what TSDS is in general and how to find out which one you're in for 1516? All right. Very good. And then y'all can pass those around. You can take them with you. I only brought one for each table. Okay, so let's talk about current technical ed data, which is what our, we're here for this morning anyway. We collect the current technical ed data two times per year. The bulk of it comes in on the fall submission. A tiny portion of it comes in in the summer submission. The first time is the fall snapshot. The last Friday in October this year is going to be October 30th. So October 30th, you're student information system operator, probably your district PEMS coordinator, is going to go into your system and they're going to, I'm going to oversimplify this, they're going to punch a button and tell the computer to give them a file extract, an extract file that they can load into either Edit Plus or have TSDS system pick up for them and load to the data warehouse. And they're going to begin validating the data. They can do it before but as of Friday, October 30th, is the official data set that, that you're going to submit to TEA. 
The second time we collect it is in the summer, and we only collect the current technical ed indicator. In the fall, there's additional indicators we'll cover here in just a moment. But in the summertime, we only get the current technical ed indicator, and we get the status of the student at the end of the year, and I'm gonna say in most cases, there are a few exceptions that I'll cover with you this morning on that. So what data do we collect for CTE? Well, the, report, the Career and Technical Ed Indicator Code has got three codes. The first one is what I call the casual Career and Technical Ed student. They want to show an animal, and so they, enter, they enroll in an ag class, or they need an elective of some kind, and so they, they go enroll in a Career and Tech class to, that matches their interest. And those students are, I'm going to say, the majority of what you're going to see in your data. So you've got the enrolled in a CTE course, zero, they're not doing current technical ed at all. And then two, you've got your coherent sequence. And everybody knows what coherent sequence is, right? Yes? Okay. It's okay, all right. So let's, let's talk about coherent sequence. Coherent sequence defines a student that's in grade nine through 12. They're enrolled in a sequential course of study which will develop occupational knowledge, skills, and competencies relating to a career and technical ed program of study. The student must have a four-year plan of study to take two or more CTE courses for three or more credits. So that's not a tremendous commitment. And if you just look at the data, you might have a student that is a one that outpaces the two in the number of courses they take. The difference is, is the coherent sequence student has that four year plan of study that's been developed and is on file for that student. That's the difference. Also, coherent sequence gets you more money, right? Okay, question. Right. But our sophomores and freshmen, because we, they did the house go five thing and they, they picked those endorsements, they seem to be going on a very, so we have a large number now all of a sudden that are in coherent sequences because of the way House Bill 5 is written. Right. We encourage our kids to take them in certain orders. Exactly. So House Bill 5 that developed the Foundation High School program has, I think, I, I would call it an unintended consequence maybe. Right has caused more structure in the current technical ed program when it comes to coherent sequence. Because the counselors have got to sit down and develop that personal graduation plan for those students. So we're not just talking about the current tech kid four year plan, we're talking about all students four year plan. What do you want to do? What do you want to be? So, great point. So, so it is okay that now our numbers are skewed Abs Yes, and I, and I, I don't like the so word. The I don't like the word skewed because it's okay. purposeful. It's purposeful, okay. But okay. I just to yes. But I think sometimes, and this is something we need to look at in our district. Sometimes, because they're following a the plan of study and they're taking two CPE courses, they inadvertently get coded as twos. Right. No, they don't take the same year. Right. No, but it's in their plan of study. The intent is there, but two CPE courses doesn't necessarily grant free credit. That's exactly right. So the key is the last phrase, a four-year plan of study filed. Uh, the one, they can be a one this year and not next year, and then a one the next year. A two, once you get that plan of study filed, there are two, there are two, there are two, there are two, until they abandon that plan. Even if they're not taking a career tech course in a particular semester or a particular school year, they're still a coherent sequence student. Yes, ma'am. Okay, hang, hang on, hang on. Any student that we have coded as a two, there would be the assumption that that student has a plan on file in their folder for that student. Yes. Um, they, they must have it. Yeah. They must have it, but you're exactly right. From the viewpoint of TEA looking at the data, if we see that there are 99 twos in your school district, 
they're going to assume that there are 99 four-year plans of study on file. Right. Yes, sir. Uh, okay, so let me let me do this. Let me let's draw a very clear distinction between a personal graduation plan edicted by House Bill Five and the four year plan of study to take two or more courses. If you sit down with a student and you develop their four year graduation and you correct me, Diane, if I get off base here, okay? To develop their personal graduation plan and you say, What what do you want to do? And he says, I want to learn to be an automotive mechanic. Well, why? Do you want to, that to be your career or do you want to go to college? No, I want to go to college, but I just want to be an automotive, learn how to do automotive mechanic work. So he takes a series of automotive, automotive mechanic courses. That doesn't constitute a four year plan of study. There's a difference between the personal graduation plan and this four year plan of study because the, the, um, Coherent sequence can lead to a post-secondary education or certification. And Maurice, uh, just a clarification, you know, it's a four-year plan, but some districts are using the personal graduation plan as a four-year plan. So it could be the Are you okay with that overlapping? As long as they have a plan. Okay, so... Okay, so we are going to have this unexpected increase in twos, which is okay if that's really what's happening, right? Okay, all right, yes, sir. Okay. Um, is that student, so they have these other ones planned, is that student of one or two? There are two. So, so they've only, they're only in one class now, but they have a plan to take more, so they are yeah. two. Right. 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 Okay. Now, the next one, raise your hand. Okay, raise your hand. I, state your name will not code any students, a tech prep student for 1516, okay? All right, all seriousness, all joking aside, this program died in 2010 when it was defunded by the federal government. And it is highly unlikely that any of you still have any students that are still in the pipe, if I can use that phrase, for the tech prep program. These kids have long graduated or dropped out of school. So although it's there, and, and the curriculum department asks us to leave it there for 15-16 as a safety net, it will not be there for 16-17. But if you look at your data and you're finding tech prep students being coded, ask why. Ask when the student entered the ninth grade. If they entered the ninth grade after 2010, they're not in the program. It's dead. Okay. Right, and the, safe, the other safety net we put in place is if you do have a legitimate student in the program, they have to be a senior this year because they're, they're not going to be able to report it for the next year. So if you have a junior and somebody thinks they're in tech prep, they're not going to be able to report it. So they need to go ahead and be migrated over to the coherent sequence program where they can uh, be reported. Now, the big deal is that the code 2 earns you some extra... Perkins money. Right. Right. The threes used to earn that, but that that's not really a good program anymore. So the twos are the ones that you really want to focus on to be sure to write. You don't want to underreport, nor do you want to overreport your coherent sequence students. If you overreport your ones. Our friends in the financial audit division will 
ask you questions and ask you to send them some money back. The, the twos, it depends upon whether or not they're taking a career and tech course at the time that the attendance data is reported is whether there'll be a, a financial impact there. So the moral of the story is you're going to have lots of ones. You're going to have many more twos now than you've had in the past, and you should have no threes on tech prep. Okay, everybody have one, two, and three straight in their mind? All right. How many of you have a working relationship with your school district PEMS coordinator? Excellent. Almost everybody's hand went up. That is, that is the person you want to connect with, and, and when you need some data, be able to tell them what you need so they can get it for you. Because the timelines to review this and get it uh, reviewed and accurate are short. Okay. There's some slides there about the tech prep going away. There's some more slides about the details of the tech prep. That's just there for your information. We're not going to go into that a whole lot because it's not really a valid program anymore. Okay. The second item we collect is this thing called a displaced homemaker. This is an individual, and, and bear with me because this is a definition written by our friends in Washington, and it is wordy and difficult to understand. They have worked primarily without remuneration or pay to care for a home and family, and for that reason has diminished marketable skills. They have been dependent on income of another family member, but are no longer supported by that income, or is a parent whose youngest dependent child will become ineligible to receive assistance under Part A of Title IV of the Social Security Act, not later than two years after the date on which the parent applies for assistance under the such title, and who is unemployed or underemployed and is experiencing difficulty in obtaining or upgrading employment. How in the world are you supposed to find those kids? That's a challenge. So what you would want to do is take these things and you might have to ask some pointed questions when the counselors are, are doing the four-year plan to figure out if you can identify. And the smaller your school district, the better you know the kids. You're going to know some of the family history there. You're going to probably be able to visually pick out some of these students and you can ask the questions. Now, I don't think there's any additional funding that comes for this. This is just a federal reporting requirement that all states that take the Perkins money have to comply with. Right. Okay, so the displaced homemaker code is there, and it is simply a yes or a no response. A one is a yes and a zero is a no. If you're not real familiar with student information systems, most of the time they're going to default to a zero and expect the, the PEMS coordinator to put a one in there to overwrite that default. So if you don't do anything, you're going to end up with all zeros. So you want to be sure that somebody's not dropping the ball. If you've gone to the trouble to identify the displaced homemakers, be sure that information is actually entered into the SI student information system so it will come out and be reported for your school. And then we have this, the single parent pregnant teen code. This indicates whether the student is in the career and technical ed program, that's the first criteria, and is unmarried or legally separated from a spouse and has minor child or children for which the parent either has custody or, or joint custody or is pregnant. So you're going to have a lot, if you just take out the first in career and technical ed program, a lot of your students will meet this definition. So that's fine, but be sure that in the current technical ed program is the final consideration here. They're a one or a two. There many school districts operate a pregnancy-related services program, and part of their program is that once a student's identified as pregnant, they will try to adjust their course schedule to put them in some courses to help prepare them for what's coming. And so you may, in your school, you may see this natural trend for all students that are pregnant to be in some sort of a current technical ed course. Doesn't mean it's going to happen, but it's a possibility. So that, you want to look at this one very closely as well. 
and there are three codes for this. It breaks it down where it's not applicable. Two is a single parent, and seven is a pregnant teen, and those are mutually exclusive. If the student is a parent, they become pregnant again, par pregnant will override parent. Does that make sense? Okay. And if there's, you know, the couple is still married, if it's married, then they don't, then it doesn't cover them at all. No, it, this covers the female and the male, right? So if they're married, the male can be a parent if they already have the child, and if the wife is pregnant again, she can be pregnant teen if she's a teenager. So depending upon some circumstances, I mean, look at this just black and white. Look at the boy, what is he? Look at the girl, what is he? And don't try to code them so that it's coordinated together. Okay? All right. Questions? Time is slipping away from us quickly here. Okay, so, okay. The fourth one is the Transportation Credit Technical Ed Service Support. This one has the, the key word is economically disadvantaged. They have to be in the career and tech program and they have to be economically disadvantaged. This code describes instances when because of the student's economic disadvantage status and their need to participate in career and technical ed training, which could be an, an off-site, off-school site job related to a course they're taking, they need help getting to and from the school. And Diane, I think there is some money for this one. Well, um, I'm seeing a nod back there. Okay, so you get a transportation allotment that is fed at least in part by this information. So if you are putting current technical ed kids on a school bus or in a school vehicle and driving them to a job site, for work or career technical ed training and they're economically disadvantaged, you need to report this one as a yes. Again, it's going to default to a zero for no, and then you'll need to override that. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so there's a difference between current technical ed for the disabled and the pure current technical ed program. It tends, depends upon what the art committee has done. If the art committee has put them in the instructional setting vocational adjustment class, or VAC as you might call it, they're, they're really not in current tech. They're taking some current tech courses, but their funding is through the special ed program. All right? It depends upon what the art committee has done. Most of the time, they're going to be VAC. Yes, sir? Right. Some of the ones that are economic will be coded a one, and the ones that are not economic will be coded zero. Of that bus service is driving kids in for a clinical rotation. Okay. So it really, these definitions are really critical to look at the parts and pieces. Now this one starts out economic disadvantaged, and they're in current tech. So that's how you want to look at the, this definition. And these definitions are straight out of the PEAM standards. So if you go to your PEAMS coordinator and you ask to see the original documentation on this, you're going to find that, unless I've made a mistake, this is verbatim out of the PEAMS definitions that they're reporting on. Okay? Okay, five. In the fall, you report to us which current technical ed services, courses, that a student is taking. <coughs> as of the last Friday in October. If they've already completed a course by the time October 30th comes around this year, you don't need to report that one to us. That will come later on in submission three for course completion reporting. But whichever courses they're enrolled in, in the fall sem on October 30th, you're gonna wanna report. So we got a coherent sequence code two student here. They elected not to take a course in the fall, but they're going to take one in the spring. They'll have no current technical ed service reported. 
the student that's a one that is taking a full year current technical ed course, first part and second part, they're going to be reported with that service ID that they're taking. This should just pull automatically for you out of your student schedule system. Your software vendors extract this data and they have some extremely sophisticated logic that they use to pull this data. So you should not have to sit there and be hand entering or copying pasting services from the course schedule for a student. These should just pull automatically for you if the course was labeled as a current tech course in your scheduling system. And the vendors may be taking care of that too because we tell them in the data standards which services are current tech and which ones are not. So there's all kinds of safety nets around this reporting, but I want you to be aware that this is a, a large part of the fall reporting. So there it is. As of the last Friday in October, what current tech course are they taking, if any? There is a, if, how many of you know what the exhaustive list of current technical ed courses are? Okay, there's a few hands. In this slide, take your pen and write a circle around C022. The, when you have a data collection system, you have data elements, many of which are supported by code tables, and then you'll have structures where you collect. Code table 22 is the service ID table, and every course that you can offer to a student from PK all the way up through high school is in this table. If you want it, go to your PEMS coordinator and say, please give me a copy of code table CO22. They will know exactly what you're talking about if they've been doing this job for any length of time. If they're brand new, they might say, what are you talking about? But um, you can help them get there. And the table is broken out that there's a column for current technical ed, and the current technical ed courses are marked as middle school or high school, M for middle and H for high school. So you can look down there and you can see exactly which ones apply to which grade levels. And then if you want to know what it takes to teach the course, then you've got to go back to the Texas Administrative Code curriculum requirements and see exactly what is listed there for that course. That's a whole other presentation. And then we have the Advanced Technical Credit Indicator Code. This identifies a high school course, it's got to be a career tech course, for which college credit may be awarded by a post-secondary institution under conditions of a local articulation agreement or the statewide Advanced Technical Credit Program Agreement. Who's familiar with this? Okay, quite a, some hands over here. A good example of this is the student that wants to become a certified welder. They are taking these courses in career and tech. Obviously, they're going to probably be a coherent sequence student. And by the time they get out of high school, they will have taken enough advanced courses related to welding that they will have, and I think I'm going to say this right, it's escrowed credit in a post-secondary institution. So let's say that there's John Smith Certified Welding School. When they get out of high school, they can walk into John Smith Certified Welding School and skip some courses because they have already, through an articulated agreement, learned the concepts that John would have had to teach them if they'd never done anything in high school. But it has to be through an articulated agreement between the school and John Smith's welding school. This indicator tells Diane and her staff which of the students taking current tech courses are pursuing this advanced technical credit. Don't confuse this with the dual credit indicator code which is a student getting both high school and college credit for a college course. Two very different things, and the system will not let you turn both of those on at the same time for the same course. It's one or the other. So there's a little freebie for you there. Is this reported in October? This is reported in the f uh, summertime. It comes in with the course completion data. It, this one is 
one that can't be reported in fall because the coursework is not completed yet. Huh? Right. Now, dependent upon how your student information system works, when you set up a student schedule, if you know that the student is taking a course for advanced technical credit purposes, you may be able to turn on a flag and so the system will automatically pull this label out for you when the data comes in in the summer submission. So your vendors have got all kinds of fancy tricks and safety nets out there so that you're not sitting there doing all this hand entry at the end of the year. Okay, question in the back? Per course. Yeah, per each unique course that is earning them advanced technical credit. Okay, and there's the, talking about the, the 415 record. Now, I want to apologize to you because this presentation still talks about PEAMS reporting in terms of the legacy system only. But many of you are still on that system. If you're on the TSDS system this year, don't go ask your PEAMS coordinator about putting something in on the PEAMS 415 course completion data record. It's not going to happen this year. It's a course transcript XML complex complicated thing um, and we're working on some tools to help schools learn that for 16 17 so that we can all kind of speak the same language but don't don't get bogged down if you're a TSDS submitter for 15 16 and this is only talking about the legacy system next time I'm here in the fall this will all be updated for TSDS ATC is a one or a zero yes or no and then in the summertime, you report the current technical ed attendance data. This are contact hours. This is big money. This is big money. Can I say this is big money again? <coughs> and you want to be sure that if a course is earning two contact hours or one contact hour or three contact hours, that it's been appropriately labeled in your SIS and your scheduling system. That's where most of this comes from. And the, the big thing you want to avoid is a student that is taking a career tech course that should be getting contact hours and earning some of that big money, and you're not. As we look to the summer, and you'll, uh, you'll see this report. And Diane, will this group be back in the summer? Yes. Okay, so I'll, if they invite me back next summer, we'll focus on the summer reporting for you. But this is just kind of a overall view of everything you've got to report. So don't worry about this one too much right now. Okay, through the, we report the, uh, the submission one. Out of the elements we talked about, we're going to report the current technical aid indicator code. Let me back up and just go through the list here. So for the fall submission, we're going to report the current technical aid indicator code. There's one. And then we're going to report the displaced homemaker, that's two. For the small fall submission, we're going to report the single parent pregnant teen code. For the fall submission, we're going to report the transportation CTE service support code. We're going to report the service IDs the students are taking on the last Friday in October. That's where the fall submission stops. The summer submission will pick up an ATC indicator code, the attendance data, and the current technical ed indicator code again. That's the only one that's really repeated between the two submissions. Okay? We're running short on time here. Uh, the rest of these slides get into some very technical topics. If you're fairly new to this, I'm going to say, Jess, you don't try to dive in and learn about the 101 record and the, the 169 record and the 179 record because these things are dead at the end of this year. I want you to focus on the elements that are enumerated one through seven and which ones are fall and which ones are summer. Let your PEEMS coordinator worry about where those get reported. As we move forward, we'll become more knowledgeable about the TSDS reporting locations and, and you'll learn more about that, but don't get bogged down in those today. That's just kind of there for your information to read if you're kind of a data junkie like me, okay?
All right, I'm going to jump down here. The decision charts. Can we get to the internet from here? Okay. I'm going to escape out of this and open up a browser. So these decision charts that Bryce is going to show you, it will take a lot of the guesswork out. It will take all the guesswork out of how it's supposed to, so they're going to be very valuable. You may want to share them with the counselors and other people who make decisions about how the coach is and how to classify, how to think about them. It's really pretty straightforward. So this is really important for you to take note of and be aware of. Very helpful. On the this is the PEMS data standards page. These are the old legacy standards, and I'm going to use them because they're easy to understand and easy to navigate here. And I know that the current technical ed indicator code is on the, the PEMS 101 student demographic record number one. And I'm going to go down here, and these are images that are included. All. Here we go. This is a flow chart that, that if you know just a little bit about current tech, you can always get the coding for a kid right. There's one for fall, the next page is one for summer. We'll not focus upon summer today. So I'm going to see if I can blow this up here just a little bit so you can see a little bit better. Is that better? Okay. So on the fall snapshot date, was the student enrolled in a current technical ed course? And you answer yes or no. If you say yes, then you've got to go down on the left side of the chart and look at these next questions, and you're going to decide if the student is a 1 or a 2. Remember, you raised your sand, hand and promised that you would not code any kids a 3 this year, right? You can, you'll see information about 3 at the bottom, but we're not going to go there. So depending upon whether they have a four-year plan of study on file or not, and they're in current tech, they're going to be a one or a two. And so you go down the left side of this chart, and you'll get there. And this last box about the tech prep, just don't even go there. If they try to go there, say no. Stop. Okay? If you answer no to the student being enrolled in a current tech course on the last Friday in October, they might still be current tech. And it would be because they are a coherent sequence student. So the chart will help you get down to that point. Now, this will be the, the handiest tool you can have. And if somebody says, I don't know how to code this kid, pull out the chart and go over it with them. Teach them to fish, right? Don't give them a fish, teach them to fish. OK, that's about all the time we have this morning. We could go further into the, the edits and the validations. But what I want you to leave with here today is knowing what's reported in fall, the things you're looking for. And if you think that you have a thousand students enrolled in current tech that are, should be in a current tech label one or two for the fall submission, and you ask your PEMS coordinator for a report and it shows you 450, say, time out. We're missing some students here. We can't be missing that many students and, and work it out. And they can give you reports off of the Edit Plus system. If you're an old legacy submitter, they can give you the reports off the TSDS system. It'll be a roster. You can see the names. You can check that against records you have, and you can determine who's missing. And then once you know who's missing, you can go figure out why. You look at their coding in their system and figure out what's not code on, turned on. Was it not, were the current tech course not labeled as current tech? Was the current tech indicator just not turned on for that student? Okay, so I appreciate your time this morning. I apologize for this being a crash course, but um, you have my contact information. Please email me if you have questions or something doesn't make sense as you're driving home later on. And enjoy the rest of your meeting. Okay. Thanks.